Shabbos, Daf Yud, Tess, continues the discussion begun in the previous few Dafim, listing situations in which one may not have a Goy do work for him, or have the appearance of doing work for him. The Gemara will discuss a few cases where it appears that if someone or something is doing work for you, the Gemara will discuss putting food out for a dog. The Gemara will discuss putting food out for an Achri. The Gemara will discuss sending letters in the hand of a guy just before Shabbos. The Gemara will discuss a number of other halachas pertaining to just before Shabbos, such as traveling on a ship just before Shabbos or laying siege to a city just before Shabbos. Then the Gemara will go back to the Mishnah and discuss the last two cases in the Mishnah. It will discuss giving clothing to a launderer to wash just before Shabbos, and we'll discuss the difference between white clothing and colored. Then we will discuss the last case where Beishami agrees to Beisillel that you're allowed to put grapes and olives into a press and let it run over Shabbos. After that, we get into a number of discussions at Helchel's Muktza, a series of machloks in between Rav and Shmuel as to um, various different objects which may or may not be Muktza, and a bit of the hint of the machlokes of Behuda Rav Shimon, which runs throughout the Masechta. So let's begin. So the Gemara continues its discussion of various cases in which there was an issue of a guy or something else doing work for a Jew on Shabbos. And there are a number of cases which the Gemara will discuss over here. The first one, the Gemara quotes a Brisa, which speaks about placing food in front of a dog in your yard, so there's no carrying issue, on Shabbos. And then it also talks about placing food in front of a Nachri on Shabbos. So the Brisa says that both of them are permitted. Now the potential concern here is that the dog may carry the food out of the yard, and therefore it will look like the dog is working for you, he's doing the malach of carrying for you. And, of course, the guy may carry it out of a yard, and people will see and think that the guy is working for you. It is both forbidden for an animal to work for you and forbidden for a guy to work for you on Shabbos. So the Bryce says they're both permitted. And the reason is that because it's food, it's something that people and animals commonly eat right there on the spot. You don't have to be concerned that they will take it out, or even if they do, that people will think that they're doing it for you. It appears that they're doing it for themselves. So the Gemara asks, why do we need both of these halachas? One of them would be enough. Mara says, if you only tell me the luck of the dog, when you see a stray dog, uh, it is incumbent upon you to feed it. The Gemara elsewhere says that people often mistreated their dogs because they didn't actually do any work. And therefore, it's a mitzvah of chesed to feed the dog. However, a nachri can fend for himself. He doesn't need you to feed him. And therefore, it's not really obligatory upon you to feed him. So I would think that therefore it's not permitted. And the Brisa therefore says that it is. Now, the Gemara quotes another Bryce. So this one notes that on Friday we view anything that happens as being very close to Shabbos. And therefore we have to be machmar on things that will end up happening on Shabbos. Wednesday and Thursday is considered to be distant enough from Shabbos that so we do not have to think about that they may end up happening on Shabbos. And the Gemara quotes the Brysa here, which has two examples of this. The first one is, if you want to rent an object to a guy. So the problem is that the guy may use it on Shabbos, and you will be collecting money from him for the usage of the object that he will have on Shabbos. You're not allowed to get paid for something that happens on Shabbos. That is considered to be a violation of Shabbos to take money for Shabbos activities. However, it's not really your problem as long as you're giving him a general rental and it's applying to a few days. So if it's Wednesday or Thursday that you're renting it to him, you don't have to worry about the fact that he's going to be using it on a Shabbos because he paid you for the entire time period. However, if you rent it on Friday, then it appears as if you're directly renting it to him to use on Shabbos. That's us, sir. The next and similar halacha is if you want to give a guy a letter to carry, to mail for you, and you're going to pay him. So if you give it to him on Friday, so it looks like you're commissioning him to do the job on Shabbos, because it's close enough to Shabbos that it looks like you're expecting him to do it for you on Shabbos. If you do it on Wednesday and Thursday, he has plenty of time to do it earlier, and therefore it's not a problem. You're not asking him to do it on Shabbos. If he decides to do it on Shabbos, that's his own problem. Nobody asked him to do it on Shabbos specifically. Now, the Gemara quotes another Brisa. We need to remind ourselves of a Machogas Beishamay and Beisil that we learned on Daf Yud Ches yesterday before we see this one. There, there was a discussion if you are giving something to a guy as a loan or as a gift and he's carrying it out of your house. Is he allowed to carry it out of your house on Shab- Is he allowed to carry it out of your house just before Shabbos? Beishamay says he's not unless he can get home before Shabbos begins. Otherwise, people will see him carrying it out of your house and it looks like he's working for you. And that's 
Not good. According to Beis Hillel, we have two possible understandings. Either he has to be able to reach the first house in the city he's going to, or he has to be able to just get clear of your house before Shabbos begins. Either way, this Machok is Beis and Beis Hillel is about the fact that it looks like the guy is doing things for you. If you can avoid that issue, there's no problem. Now the Gemara has a discussion here on this stuff. If you're giving a guy a letter to carry and you're asking him to mail it for you. So here we have an additional problem. Besides for that Machok is Beis and Beis Hillel, we have an additional problem that if the guy is going to carry it on Shabbos, he actually is doing Malacha for you on Shabbos and he's working for you, and that's forbidden. So the Gemara brings in two factors over here. The Gemara brings in the factor of are you paying him a fixed rate and is there a post office in the city that he's traveling to? And the Gemara comes out with the following conclusion. It's a bit confusing the steps that lead up to it, but the Gemara says as follows. If you're paying him a fixed rate, then we're not worried about the fact that he might do work for you on Shabbos. Even if he actually carries it for you on Shabbos, it's not a problem because you're paying him a fixed rate. And therefore, whatever work he's doing and when he's doing it, he's doing it for himself. He's earning his money. He could have waited till after Shabbos to do it. That's already his problem when he fulfills it. But since you're paying him a fixed amount, any time he chooses to do the work is his own interest. It's not your interest. It's not considered like he's doing work for you. Therefore, the Machokas Beis Shammai and Beis will be the only thing that that's relevant. Will people see him and think that he's doing work for you? It's, ir- it's irrelevant that he actually is working for you because you're paying a fixed rate. Now, that's in a case where he, you are paying him a fixed rate. Let's say you're not paying him a fixed rate. So, here, the Bryce says it depends if there is a doar in the city or not. Now, Rashi translates doar as the mayor of the town. We'll go with the other pshat, which is more well known, that the doar is the post office. If there's no post office in the town, then the guy may show up in town, and he's trying to deliver the letter, and doesn't know where the person that he needs to bring it to is. And therefore, this job can continue for a very long time. So, we shouldn't allow him to do it, because he's going to end up caring for you on Shabbos. So in a case like that, everyone agrees you cannot allow him to do it for you Arab Shabbos because he may end up traveling for who knows how long and doing work for you on Shabbos and that will be totally forbidden. The case that we're left with discussing is where you're not paying him a fixed rate, but there is a doar, there is a post office in the city. In a case like that, we have an interesting application of the Machogos Beis Shammai and Beis Hill. Beis Shammai says, here, the guy has to be able to reach the door. He has to be able to reach the post office. Then he'll deliver the letter there, and you don't have to worry about him carrying it for you on Shabbos. Of course, with the applicable re- restriction that we said before, that it shouldn't look like he's doing Melacha for you on Shabbos. However, Beis Hill will say, he doesn't have to get all the way to the post office. He, he only has to get to the first house in the city, because he could always deposit it there and come pick it up again from there later. The next discussion the Gemara quotes is again a Brisa, and this is referring to setting sail on a ship. Now, the halacha is that Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday are considered to be the days before the coming Shabbos. Therefore, we have to start being concerned about where will we be on Shabbos during Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday before it. So, the Gemara says you cannot set sail on a ship if you're going to end up having to be on the ship over Shabbos. There is actually a machlokas we shown him here what the reason is. There is no less than five opinions. The opinion of the Balamar is that you may end up having to do malacha on the ship, which you will have to do. You will be, you will be required to do because it will be pikoch nefesh. It will be a life-saving activity. However, to put yourself in a situation before Shabbos in which you will end up having to be machal Shabbos, even though you'll have to because it will be a life-saving activity, situation, but you're not to put yourself in a situation like that knowingly within three days of Shabbos. However, from Tuesday and earlier, you are allowed to because you don't have to start planning for the coming Shabbos that early in the week. Now, Allah therefore is that he's not allowed to set sail for a Dvarashos, for an optional activity on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, if he's going to end up staying on the ship on Shabbos. If it's a short trip that he could do in one day, then he's allowed. He doesn't have to worry that the trip will extend onto Shabbos. Now, if it's for a mitzvah, then he is allowed to set sail even within three days before Shabbos. However, he should tell the guy who runs the ship that he has to stop the ship and uh, drop the anchor on Shabbos. And the guy has to agree. If the guy agrees, then you're allowed to set sail, because at least you did what you can to avoid having to be Mechal Shabbos in a situation of Pikuach Nefesh. Let's say you agree with the guy and the guy doesn't fulfill what he said. Okay, that's not your problem. As long as the guy agreed, then you fulfill your obligation to take care of Shabbos and make sure that you're not sailing on Shabbos. If Shimon Megamliel says, you don't even have to get the guy to agree. You're allowed to put yourself in a situation like that for a Dvar Mitzvah, and it's okay. Now the Gemara has another Bryce, which, 
with a very similar halacha. We're not allowed to lay siege on a city within three days of Shabbos, meaning on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. Again, because you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you'll be fighting a war and you'll have to be Mechal Shabbos, even in a situation of Bikoach Nefesh, on Shabbos. However, if you started the siege before those three days and the siege didn't end by Shabbos, then you're allowed to continue the siege on Shabbos. The Pasuk tells us you should continue a siege ad ridita until you conquer the city, and therefore you don't have to stop as long as you started more than three days before Shabbos. The Gemara now returns to the Mishnah, where we saw that Roshim and Gamliel said that the medic in his father's house was that they gave white clothing to a launderer to wash three days before Shabbos, because it took a long time to wash the three days. Now, the Gemara quotes a brisa that repeats this custom. The Gemara says that Rabbi Tzaddik said that the custom in the house of Roshim of Rabbi Gamliel was that they would give white clothing to a launderer three days before Shabbos to give him time to finish it before Shabbos. But colored clothing they would give even on Friday because they didn't need so much time to finish cleaning it. So the Bryce says, and from here we learn, that it's harder to wash white clothing than it is to wash colored. Now why is that important? To teach you that you should be paying more for washing white than you should be paying for washing colored. Then the Gemara quotes an incident here. The Gemara says that Bai was giving clothing to wash to a launderer, and he said to him, how much do you charge? And the launderer said, uh, well, it's colored, but I want, I'm want i going to charge the same as I charge for whites. And we said, Abayah said to him, but you're wrong, you can't, because the Chacham already taught us in this b'risa that white is more expensive, so for my colors, you should charge less. Then the Gemara quotes another piece of advice from Abayah. Abayah says, when you give clothing to a launderer, you should measure it when you give it, measure it when you get it back, make sure it's the same size. If it's shorter, you know he shrunk it, and if it's longer, you know he stretched it. Okay, now the Gemara goes to the next case in the Mishnah, which is the final one, in which Beis Shammai actually agrees to Beis Hill. This is referring to where you put crushed olives or grapes in a press, and you put the weights on it, and then you let it run the entire Shabbos, and the oil squeezes out of the olives, and the wine squeezes out of the grapes. The entire Shabbos is dripping out bit by bit. So even though this malacha is running over Shabbos, the Mishnah says that Beis Shammai agrees that this is mutter. So the Gemara wants to know, how come here Beis Shammai agrees? And my answer is because this is only an Isser de Rabbanon. says you're allowed to set up an Isser de Rabbanon to run before Shabbos. An Isser de Rabbanon, you're not allowed to. Now, uh, why is this an Isser de Rabbanon? So the Gemara is going to um, try to explain why this is only an Isser de Rabbanon. The structure of the explanation will be that since it's chopped up, the juice is already dripping out of it. So to squeeze juice out of fruits that would have dripped out on its own had you not squeezed it, because it's already chopped, that squeezing is only an answer to Rabbana. Midaraisa, you're not allowed to squeeze juice out of grapes and olives that are solid. Once the grapes and olives are chopped, the juice will all drip out of it eventually on its own. On its own, all you're doing by squeezing them is hastening the process. That's only an answer to Rabbana. And on that, Bashami agrees, you're allowed to set it up to run before Shabbos. So now the Gemara wants to know who is the Tana of this Mishnah who says that squeezing liquid that would come out on its own because it's chopped up, who's the Tana that says that that's only an Eser Darabanan? And the Gemara we're here will have two options. We'll have two Bryces with two different Cheetahs that seem to hold this way. And the Gemara will ask each one, the Amara who brings each one, why does he not hold of the other one? So the first one we have here is brought by... And he says, this is Rabbi Shmuel. So we have a rice that says as follows. If somebody takes garlic, unripe grapes, or grain, chops them up, and puts them in a wine press, you're allowed to let it run over Shabbos, according to Rabbi Shmuel. Rabbi Kiva says, it's usher. So you see, Rabbi Shmuel says, you're allowed to let it run over Shabbos. Why? Obviously, because Rabbi Shmuel holds that it's an Eser der Abanan. And therefore, Rabbi Shmuel will be the author of our Mishnah, and he will say that Rabbi agrees that it's mutter because it's only an Eser Dirabanan. Obviously, the Gemara here is assuming that Rabbi Yishma and Rabbi Kira both hold like Beis Shammai. Otherwise, it wouldn't be relevant. Okay, so that's the first approach, that this Mishnah is Rabbi Yishma, who says in this case of the crushed garlic and grain and unripe grapes, that you're allowed to let it run in the wine press over Shabbos, because it's only Nasser Dirabanan. Now the Gemara is the second approach. This is Rabbi Lazar, the Amor, quoting Rabbi Lazar, the Tana who has a case of honeycombs. And he says that he has a rice. If you smash up honeycombs before Shabbos, you're allowed to eat the honey that comes out of it. Now, if it would be usher doi rice to squeeze the honey out of it, you wouldn't be allowed to eat it. 
because we would ask you, we would say you can't eat the honey because if we let you eat it, then you may come to squeeze it. Since we're letting you eat it, since our Allah holds you're allowed to eat it, it's clear that he holds that to actually squeeze the honey out of the chopped honeycombs would only be an iser derabanan. So therefore, we have a, an opinion. We have Rebbe Lazar holds that to squeeze the liquid out of a chopped up thing that's holding it. In this case, it's not fruits, it's honeycombs. And that is mutter. So we have two here. We have this Rebbe Shmuel in the case of the grain and things. And we have Rabbi Elazar in the case of the honeycombs. Now the Gemara wants to know why does each one not hold of the other one? Each Amura who quoted his sheet, why does not hold of the other one? So first the Gemara says, why does the Rebbe Shmuel not quote Rabbi Elazar? So the Gemara says, well, Rabbi Elazar's case of the honeycomb might not be applicable to this case over here. Because if you think about it, honeycomb that's chopped up is already liquid. It's liquid that's removed from the honeycombs. So to let it flow out of the honeycomb mush, that it's already extracted from it. So maybe that's an Iser Derabanan. But maybe just because he holds it, that's an Iser Derabanan does not mean that he holds in the case of the olives and the grapes that are chopped, where the liquid is still absorbed in the solid fruit and it has to actually seep out. That's a whole different thing. That's much more of an Iser. Maybe he holds it, that's an Iser Derabanan. Okay. Now, the Gemara uh, Agav wants to know how come the other Amira doesn't is not bothered by this. The Gemara says that he has a price explicitly where... Um, Rav uh, Elazar says, even in the case of olives or grapes, he even says explicitly that you're allowed to let it run um, on Shabbos, and therefore there's no difference between honeycomb and olive and grapes. The Gemara says that the other Amira was not aware of this extra brisa that he has. Okay, now the Gemara says, let's go to the other Amira who was Rabbi Yesi, who was Rav Elazar, who quoted the case of Rabbi Shmuel, who said that you're allowed to put grain, unripe grapes, and garlic into an olive press and let it run before Shabbos if they're if they're chopped up. So that's a very good explanation for who the author of our Mishnah was. How come it was doesn't hold that way? So Yomar says like this: there are three levels of chopping. There's chopped, there's pounded, and then there's mashed. And the Gemara says, this machok is between Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi Kiva that you're telling me about is only in a case where it's chopped and pounded, but it's not mashed. That's where there's a machok. That has nothing to do with our Mishnah. Our Mishnah is not talking about the case. Our Mishnah is talking about olives and grapes that are crushed. That is equivalent to just chopped. In the case of just chopped, Rabbi Kiva and Rabbi Yeshua never argued. They both agree that that's forbidden, that that's an Isra Daraisa. Therefore, your machlokas that you have in the case where it's both chopped and pounded is not relevant to this discussion, and neither of them hold like this discussion that if it's just chopped, it is an Isra Darabanan. That has to be Rabbi Lozar, who discussed it by honeycombs. Now the Gemara gives a psak, and Yeshua Chanin a paskin, like Rabbi Yishmael. Now the Gemara moves on to a discussion about Hilchos Mukta, which is related because it's talking about pressing olives. And here we have three discussions. Each one is a machlokas between Rav and Shmuel, whether something is Mukta or not. And in each of the cases, Rav says it's Mukta and Shmuel says it's not Mukta. The first discussion is oil, which is left in the press after it's finished pressing, and the mats that are put on top of the olives to squeeze them. So, Rav says that it's muktzah because these are not meant to be used on Shabbos. The technical definition of muktzah is something which is not meant for Shabbos use. It may have a function, but it's not meant for Shabbos use. So, Rav says the oil is meant to be given as wages for the pressers. That's what their wage was. It was the oil left in the press after everything else was flowed out. So, that's therefore commercial use. It's wages. So, it's muktzah on Shabbos. And the mats are used to press the olives, which is a... Malacha, not something you're allowed to do on Shabbos, and therefore the mats have no function on Shabbos. Therefore they're Mukta. Shmuel says it's not Mukta. The Gemara later will explain why. The next Machok is, is in a case of mats used for covering ship's cargo. So Rav says that again, that's something that's for commercial use, and therefore it's Mukta. Shmuel says it's not. The third Machok is over here is actually a set of three or four cases. It is a goat that you keep for milk, a sheep that you keep for sharing the wool, a chicken that you keep for eggs, an ox that you keep for plowing, and the dates that you keep to sell. So all these things are technically edible on Yantif. You could shech the goat on Yantif, you could shech the sheep, you could shech the chicken, and you could uh, shech the axe, and you can eat the dates. All these things can be eaten on Yantif. However, you do not intend to eat them on Yantif because you're keeping them for their produce. 
So you never really intended for it to be food on Yontif. So therefore, when Yontif began, it wasn't food. It was set aside for a non-Yontif function. So therefore, on Yontif, it should be mukta. That's what uh, Rav holds. The Shemuel says all these are mutter. So the Gemara now says this is based on a famous machlokas between Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Shimon, the Tanayim, which extends all throughout Hechel's Shabbos. Rabbi Yehuda holds that something is mukta if its use is not one that you intended for Shabbos. And Rabbi Shimon says it's only mukta if it has no use at all. If it is functionless. So therefore, um, Rabbi Shimon would say all these cases are mutter because they all have a function. It's just not a function that you're actually going to do on Shabbos. The Gemara now quotes an incident that happened about this. The Gemara says there was a Talmud Chacham who was in a place called Charta de Arges. And over there, he had a case where he paskined like Rav Shimon. And he was Mekol and these in Yane Mukta. And Rav Hamnuna, who was there, put him in Cherim. So Gemara says, what did he do that for? We pass on that group, Shimon. So Gemara says, because Rav was the Rav in the area, Chate Dargez was under his, uh, he was the Mar da Asra, and Rav holds like of Yehuda, and therefore he did not have a right to pass on against Rav. Gemara has another similar story of two Talmud Chachamim that were in a house that caught fire. And there's a machokas between Rabbi Barzavda and Rav Huna. How much you're allowed to save if there's a fire? You're allowed to save one container of food or four or five containers. And one did like Rabbi Barzavda, one did like Rav Huna, one saved four or five, and one only saved one container. This is the end of this Gemara, and that takes us to the next Mishnah, which was quoted earlier.